Stay healthy. Yep. Hello, everybody. To Good to see you all. Hey, Matt. Hi, Hi. Matt. Matt, you got your hair cut. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's oh, oh, oh. <laughs> oh, my God. No wonder mind, we're having 90-degree so weather down here. <laughs> it's still all there. I'd be glad you got it. <laughs> I am, too. Anya likes it as well. <laughs> Using the wrong things, I can put it on this. One. Mark, Mark, and, and Tony and I were just talking. We were just talk, emailing back and forth for his coming expedition. So, yeah, yeah, good deal. You're making communications with everybody. That's great. Oh yeah, yeah, love the expeditioners. And um, yeah, we're um, this one's going to be. Uh, we got two expeditions that we're doing an introduction here for. One is for next week, which is the cooking program. And then there's the other, which is the expedition at the end of the month for digging at the overseer's house. So we'll yeah, be- That's us. Uh, you'll be able to, um, uh, if there's any leftovers, we'll save them for you all um, uh, <laughs> following the expedition. I'm trying to so, get Mark to come down and see us while he's that close. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I got a lemon tree that could use his help. <laughs> Oh, more, more mulch. Okay, more mulch. Oh, next, uh, next week, um, uh, we're going to, um, Tess and I were stacking wood today for the uh, cooking program. Jerome put in an order for about uh, two cords of wood. He's not, he's not messing around with uh, wanting to run out of wood during the cooking program. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, so, um, I wanted to, we're, we also do these as a, um, uh, you know, get making sure that no one, if anyone has any questions, they can ask about arriving, uh, arriving, arriving. Um, and also there a number of times um, last, I guess two weeks ago, no, a week ago, we had a, uh, a preservation program where we're uh, teaching folks how to record buildings. Tessa was, she did a great job on that one. And we recorded two houses uh, that were late 19th century, probably um, built by former enslaved uh, community members here at Montpelier. We're finding more information about these structures all the time. It's pretty amazing. But several participants ended up staying down in Richmond. And I was just like, oh my goodness, this is such a long drive for you. So I want to make sure if anybody is getting a hotel, they're, uh, Orange is small, but we do have hotels. Uh, and you can, um, there's a uh, Comfort Inn. I think that's the one, Gail and Tony, you all have stayed in before, right? The Comfort yes. Inn? Yes. Yeah, and they do a really good job. There's and, Round and, Hill. And, some good, some bad. And Round Top. Or, or Round Top, Round Top, or, yeah, the, uh, up up um, uh, north of Orange. Yeah. So if anybody has any questions about that, you can uh, email Melissa or myself at mreebs at Um Does anybody... Are you not... Are you not mm -hmm. uh, talking about the village very much um, we when folks get here we we do that otherwise it gets pretty confusing so uh folks that are alumni know about it and same as arlington house so yeah. um but uh if anybody has any questions about arrivals you know or what to bring let me know um hopefully everybody get the background package for um uh, what to bring on the expedition what to expect so and for, um, you know, we we used to, uh, about a year ago, we were doing the uh, um, the COVID uh, programs. We're pretty, um, you know, going with the, the standards on that, that, um, you know, hopefully, you know, everyone is uh, vaccinated, uh, have requirement of being vaccinated. Um, if you, if you do um, have, you um, with with traveling, you know, just try to be safe for your sake more than anybody else's. And uh, uh, we um, we've got all kinds of outdoor space that we're going to be uh, using. So both for the cooking program and for the uh, the expedition for the, uh, the the dig. So what what I like to do um, uh, for the introductory lecture is provide a um, a sense of what Montpelier is, some of the history. Uh, and 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 tell it from the landscape perspective. And, and one thing that we 
really focus on with the programs is what we call the power of place. And a number of y'all are familiar with this in that, you know, it, it's a, a place evokes a certain sense of its history, its its um, context. And um, how many of y'all have heard of power of place? Nice. What are some examples of power of place um, and, and, and how might it pertain to what we're going to be doing at Montpelier? Well, with us, it's, or I should speak for myself. I'll let speak for Tony for all these years. So he doesn't talk. So um, to me, the power of place is what gives you comfort, what what hmm. gives you information, what makes things um, comfortable for you. Are you there? I'm here. Someone started screen sharing. Yeah. And I'm going to... Okay, there we go. All like right. We're back. Okay. Thanks. Okay. <laughs> but it, it just, for me, it's it, it's what makes me comfortable and happy and where I want to go. Yeah. So it's 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 more about the your present circumstance and yeah. yeah. For, us, for us, it is. Absolutely. Yeah. And that. Uh, who else? What else? What other ideas about power of place, Mark? For me, it's it's always been some sense of history. Um, We've always had old houses in New England and moving here, the oldest house we could find is 1960. So in Southern California, mm -hmm. um, but it, th this house has a, a certain spirit to it. And um, I, I, I find history in the backyard. We found a silver spoon that some baby probably threw off its you know, high chair in, in you know 1962 or they were playing dolls out back or something but you know I, I wouldn't have seen it if I hadn't been on my knees digging with you guys but I was yeah. looking for things I'm always looking for things but it's it's a sense of history and a shared history absolutely who else about power of place <laughs> I think that uh, the other thing that we have to be reminded of is that where we're at influences how we think. So I think that, uh, you know, places have influences on on our outcomes and our expectations. So we go to a lot of places and they provide us with settings to have lots of different feelings. Yeah, James, that's absolutely true. And nowhere is that more relevant than uh, a site like Montpelier, where, you know, depending on... Um, who you are, who you've been, uh, you know, in the present, but also in the past, you know, at, at plantations, I'm sure you all have heard that, you know, there are a number of plantations that um, have weddings and, you know, in, in, a, in a sense, in a visual sense, they're a beautiful place, but, and that is from, you know, mainly a, 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 a sense of not having a, a sense of what the history is at that place. But in, in a very deep sense, there's histories at these plantations that's very painful for a lot of people with, with the uh, history of slavery. So you can have the same scene, same exact, you know, from Montpelier, the view of the mountains and or the view of the columns on the front of the house. Uh, oftentimes we've done pictures on the front of the house and uh, remember a, a close friend of mine um, uh, who's a member of the local uh, African-American community. She said, Matt, I don't want to have my picture taken in front of the house with those columns. Those are, you know, she's never been in the house and doesn't want to be in the house. So it's not a place that gives her that sense of beauty or security. And she sticks to the landscape where her ancestors, you know, made their home. So very different for different people. And of course, in the past, it would have been different as well. I mean, the sense of, you know, with, with Mr. Madison looking at the columns, he would have likely have been thinking about um you know about palladio and and the uh the the, the books of architecture that he he researched to to um to get the concept of that uh um portico that's colonnaded a colonnaded portico and for the enslaved individuals who the enslaved masons who built that portico they would have had either a sense of you know remembering the dread of the height of building that space or 
the 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 pride in understanding that they knew where to source the clay and they were the ones that uh, knew how to slake the lime for the mortar and, and and create the whitewash that went on there and that gave them a sense of security where they had ownership over that knowledge and they were used that be able to use that for their position so power of place has you know many different meanings for different people landscapes change through time i i always marvel at um sites that you know um when i first came to montpelier and, and my, our, our kids were little we used to fly kites in this one location and it turned out it was a, it was this entire farm complex and for us it was a field but once we did the archaeology it became this you know the heart of the plantation where the farm complex was so a very different uh, uh power of place you know with discoveries under the ground so what what you all are going to be doing this this week both for the cooking program but also for the archaeology program in the same way for the cooking <clears> program <throat> you all are going to be in the south yard in the space that we've rebuilt based on the archaeology and we'll talk a little bit about that today and a lot about it next week but you're going to be transforming a visitor space into a space that is uh, alive with cooking, with the smells of a wood fire, the smells and, and the feel of, uh, of the food and the sounds of, you know, meal preparation, and give it a sense of what that space was in the 1820s, which is, is amazing. And then for those of you all coming on the archaeology program at the end of the, end of the month for the excavating at the overseer's house, we're going to be uncovering features that give evidence for what the buildings were at, the, at, at we, what we call the overseer's house, which is a complex set of sites and buildings and homes that was went beyond just the overseer. And we'll talk a little, little bit about that in a second. But underneath all this, what gives, you know, makes Montpelier a place that um, has such depth and emotion for so many people is what we've been able to discover with the archaeology and under, begin, been able to recover and understand about how the space looked, how it was used, what it meant to different groups of people. And uh, uh, it's exciting to have you all be uh, part of this. And that's one thing that, you know, we're going to really, um, really drill down into when you're here is, you know, having you all think about that sense of place and, and uh, how you conceive of it, how you, how we imagine it, you know, both in terms of, you know, we don't have a completely reconstructed landscape. It, it's partially interpreted and reconstructed because first, we haven't finished all the archaeology. That's going to take a long, long time, job security for us. Uh, but then also, even if we found all the sites, it would literally be impossible to reconstruct every single one because it's a modern visitor amenity, you know, where, where visitors come. So there's uh, certain tra tra uh, trade-offs that have to be made. But what I want to do at this point is really dive into some of the history. And I try to have this not be a monologue, but so many times being seven o'clock at night and, uh, and it, or for some of you a little bit, a little bit earlier, um, uh, a lot of you have had your dinner and just settle in and you can listen. But if you want to ask questions, don't hesitate. I'm going to try to give pauses at various points to have you all ask. And hopefully you, you all have had a chance to look at and read some of the readings when you get here, you'll get the um, our archaeology booklet. Um, and uh, for those of you all that are listening to this recording, um, uh, we'll um, you know we're gonna uh, have um, uh, make more readings available for you when when you're here. So um, what I'm gonna do at this point is I'm gonna share screens here, and uh, let's see. So hopefully you all can see. Um, I'm going to my video. There we go. So can you all see the screen? Yep. Yeah. All right. Well, what I like to do, what I've, since we've developed our GIS mapping, I've really enjoyed, uh, you know, doing this presentation, not with PowerPoint, but through GIS. And uh, for those of you who are coming on the, on the week long program, you're going to learn a little bit more about GIS, both how we record all the data in the field and enter it into the iPads. And for those of you that are here next week for the cooking program, if you're interested in GIS, I can show you, you know, what we're what we're using it uh, with and for. You'll we're going to be up at in the south yard, and we'll be close to where Dennis is working. He's locating a, a set of um, 
quarters. Uh, and if you look at the, the property, let me give you a sense of what the property is. We're Montpelier is about 2,700 acres. So it's this land mass that's in brown. Um, and this is all owned by the National Trust for Historic Preservation um, and operated by uh, jointly today by the Montpelier Foundation and the Montpelier Descendant uh, Committee. So we're under joint uh, um, uh, partnership and stewardship with the uh, the MDC, which has been a recent development and has been made even more exciting with the um, gift we just re received from the Mellon Foundation to build a memorial um, and uh, uh, at the uh, the burial ground. We'll talk about that in a second. But for where Montpelier is, um, if you zoom out on this map, you can see Monticello here. Uh, you've got <clears throat> uh, Richmond is down. Uh, this is uh, Fredericksburg right here. Richmond is down in this area. So this is what's called the arc, which is this arc of communities that you know connects from Fredericksburg. You have the Rappah Rappahannock that flows that has um, the Rapidan flow into it up past Montpelier, and then for um, Monticello you've got the James River that snakes its way, and then the Ravana that goes through the area of Monticello snakes its way into, um, into the, uh, into the, into the uh, James River. But these two basins hold this incredible set of sites, but also an incredibly well-connected set of descendant communities, where uh, this is what forms the, the Montpelier Descendant Committee, which is these group of communities that are linked by these drainages of these river basins. And, you know, the, the families are all, you know, literally connected, uh, you know, just as the, uh, the enslaver families are. Like, you know, you think about the Carters and the Lees and the Madisons and the Willises and the Washingtons, uh, all Jeffersons, all these folks, their trees are intertwined. And it's the same with the, uh, the, um, uh, the descendants of the enslaved. And, this what we what we're doing um, is part of our research is beginning to understand these connections and using GIS to make these connections. So we're starting to slowly get all these deeds entered. But for Montpelier, when you look at Montpelier today, what's in again the brown line is what makes up the Montpelier's two thousand six hundred and fifty acres. This area right in here, the gray is Madison uh, owned lands. And this was the Madison plantation for much of the 18th and into the early 19th century. And for today, when you look at Montpelier, here's Route 20. Uh, the Gilmore cabin is uh, uh, right uh, right here. Um, uh, let me turn off, I've got so many layers on here. Uh, actually, I'm not gonna turn layers off because I need some of those. But the Gilmore cabin right here, right across Route 20, is um, on Route 20, as well as some of the Civil War encampments that you all are gonna be doing tours on. And then down here, you get Centerfield here, that main entrance into Montpelier. You've got the main house uh, right here, which is the, restored to its 1820s appearance. You've got the visitor center here, and the visitor core is what most people experience what the, when they're at Montpelier. Most folks, when they're at Montpelier, basically experience everything from the temple, which was built in 1811 and is built atop a, an 18th century blacksmith shop, literally, all the way down to the Madison Family Cemetery, which is where um, the, uh, 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 the Madison family is, um, is buried. And this bracketing is what we focus, this bracketed area between the temple uh, which includes the ice pond down here over to the Madison Family <laughs> Cemetery, is what we've focused a lot of our research on over the past 25 years to understand and really be able to flesh out this part of the historic core, which is also the visitor core today. And so some of the history, like in a, just a super brief thumbnail um, that we've discovered about this space, ranges from three generations of Madison ownership. And of course, you all know the original Madison ownership is with Francis Madison. This is the um, what's called Mount Pleasant down here by the Madison Family Cemetery. And Francis Madison, her um, one of her envelopes here that was addressed to her, uh, ran the plantation from the death of her husband in 1732 up until her death in 1761. And during this time, 
what um, she ran this plantation as was a tobacco plantation. Most of the agriculture at the time was uh, a swooden based or hoe based agriculture with hilling of soil to uh, plant tobacco. So this sort of scene you can see right here in this Latrobe uh, scene from the late 18th century. And uh, the second generation of Madisons, they don't establish themselves down at Mount Pleasant, but up closer to the main house. So when uh, James and uh, um, uh, James Sr., which is the eldest son of, uh, of Francis Madison, Mar marries uh, Nellie Conway Madison in 1749, they don't move into the main house. What we've discovered recently is what they move into is a much smaller structure that we call the kitchen. And earlier it was the uh, a planter's cottage. And this is all part of the South Yard today, but this planter, planter's cottage, which is a, um, a 20 by 16 structure was used as the, um, as the Madison's, James Madison Sr. and Nellie Conway Madison's first home from 1749 when they were married or oh, actually 1750 when James Madison Sr. was born, or James Madison Jr. was born, up until 1765 when the main house is finally built, when the core of the main house is built. And so um, what we've uh, been able to really begin to understand over the past 10 years is the complexity of intergenerational kind of passing the baton, where, um, you know, it, it's, not an, it's not when the senior male comes of age that this transition occurs, a lot of times it's when the eldest generation either passes on or pa decides to pass along the operations of the estate. And what we found is there's very different operations of the plantation during this time period. So for example, when James Madison Sr. and uh, Nellie Conway Madison take over, the, take over the operations of the plantation around the Revolutionary War, this is when they, the blacksmith starts to develop uh, plow, plows for plowing, and you get really a, a radical reopening of the landscape. And where you have um, this uh, um, directional plowing, you get a lot of erosion, a lot of soil loss. It's the end of tobacco production in a major way around the time of the revolution. And But it, the, when you get a lot of grains that start to be uh, grown. And this is really relevant for the studies we've been doing of the home farm, because by the time you get to the 18, um, uh, the 1811 time period is when James and Dolly Madison have begun their um, plans for retirement at Montpelier, but it's also when the home farm is established. And the home farm is this area that's just below the visitor center. So this is a, a modern day shot of the home farm you can see the visitor center here. The main house is back behind these trees in this direction. And what we found in this area is beginning in the in the probably the, the early 18 teens is when the um some of this area begins to be built out with the blacksmith shops moving from up by the main house down to the farm complex <clears throat> in this area when the overseer's house is built and you have all these structures that are put in place. And what we've been doing with the with with it looking at this area is doing metal detector survey to locate these sites, we'll, and we'll talk more about that when you all get here. But what we've done is been able to do three D reconstructions using CAD of what this area would have looked like. So you can see what today is the visitor center would have been an area of um, of a stable, and then also of uh, of um, pasture for horses. So when Visitors like the Marquis de Lafayette shows up with a coach and coach horses. All those horses would have been put to pasture out here where today people pasture their cars, so to speak. And then down uh, where we're excavating um, beginning at the end of this month is going to be over at the overseer's house. And uh, we've got new units we're laying out for that like right now. And um, one, of the, one of the items that we're going to be focusing on uh, this season and we're starting vegetation surveys there now, is another area that would have spanned the entire time period. And this is the, the burial ground for the enslaved community. Um, for years, we've known about this burial ground through um, the, uh, uh, the depressions that are in the ground. 
uh, which is uh, what's shown in this picture filled with snow, a shot I took back in 2002. And since this that time, what we've been able to understand is the the area of the um, of these woods. You can see in detail in this map all these woods that are in this area. This was this this massive area of graves. Uh, we found about five years ago through ground penetrating radar evidence for about 200 graves in this area. But since that time, we've cleared out the undergrowth at the at the uh, burial ground uh, over this winter, and we've got burials running all the way down to the bottom of the where the racetrack begins. And so there's just some really amazing archaeology we're going to be doing in this space. Uh, we'll be talking about about that, about that when you all are here, but it's um, what we're interested in looking at in this space over this next season and, and next year as well is understanding how the enslaved, when they buried their their loved ones in this space, how they com you, how they commemorated that space. So, for example, over at the uh, the Madison Family Cemetery, how that commemoration happened was you know later on with monuments but with this brick wall. And at the burial ground, was there a similar, you know, placement of, you know, a fence in this area, any sort of offerings made? We want to be able to understand that to help inform the, you know, building a memorial for the enslaved there. Matthew, can I ask you a question? Yeah, absolutely. Go ahead, James. At the bottom of your map um, that you're showing now, there's parch marks in the middle of that field, like close to the middle of the bottom of the frame, you see them? Yeah. yeah, right there. So yeah. what is the the one above it, the one off where the, the hexagon is at? Uh to the yeah, right there. So what right is there? that? Yeah, what is that area in there? This um different Google maps, you get different results. This is um this the, the what's right here is the that looks like that's a septic field right here. Okay. This one, I don't know if sometimes when they do the haying, you'll get this patterning. But you're right, James. This these squares in here, there's no reason for those to be there. I, what what I'd want to do, what we've got in these on the on this map. Let me see if I can bring it up here because this is this is actually a new um, uh, uh, aerial map. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, we got the 37 aerial right here. Let's give this a second to pop up. Still yeah. there. It's it's uh so when you well let go so you have the parch marks somewhat outlined, but then you have the path more evident in the the older the older aerials. So it's kind of interesting because yeah, there's symmetry to it. There is, yeah. This this, this almost looks like a uh, a line, like a, a septic line or a, a pipeline going out here, but I know there's no trench in that area. Yeah, I'm gonna right. have to look at that, James. That's uh there when we um if you look at the um we've got something called um LIDAR maps, which yeah. give high high resolution terrain. And what's okay. fun to like in this one, here you can see it this line coming out here, this leads to the septic field right here. So if you turn off the hill shade here, what you can see is that where the septic is here, that's a totally different area. So I don't know what that is. That's really cool. Mm. This is this is exactly the kind of thing we're looking for. We're, what we've done in this area is we've done um, metal detector surveys all across the um, the home farm, but also as you can see in the map right here. Oh, let me let me turn on the twenty meter. We've done metal detector surveys all across the historic core to locate where sites are. And so mm -hmm. what do you think you find with a metal detector survey where there'd be a building that fell down? Nails. Yeah. Nails. Yeah, absolutely. That's what metal detectorists call Montpelier uh, gold. You've got with the um, the nails, what we've got with uh, nail manufacturing is uh, what really blew us away when we started doing the metal detector survey is when we were doing the restoration of the house is every change in the house corresponds with a change in nail manufacture. And this mm -hmm. also corresponds to with each generation of, of enslaver of the Madison family, you get differences in agricultural techniques that are being used and the economy of the plantation changes. 
So we're able to take these nails and through the metal detector surveys with a 20 meter grid, which you can see at this level, all these larger squares all across, it's actually all across the property. We've been doing these 20 meter surveys. That's how we locate the sites. And then when you get to find sites, we lay out a 10 foot grid. And what we're able to do is go from this very coarse resolution where you can see where sites are, like in this area, you've got this large area of sites here. But when you do the 10 foot metal detector survey, all of a sudden you get three different sites show up. You've got the blacksmith shop right here where we found all kinds of, we found the, um, this is Gail and Tony's unit right here from years ago, uh, where we found what we think is the, the base for the forge of the, of the, of the um, blacksmith shop. But in the units, we found, you know, thousands of, of clipped iron pieces, the slag. And with the metal detector survey, this showed up in this massive concentration of iron. And where we're excavating right now at the overseer's house, you get this area here of concentration, which is the 19th century overseer, and then potentially an 18th century site. And then up in here, you've got the Mount Pleasant site. So all these start differentiating. And that's how we know how to place the units. And right where, long-winded way to get to what you were talking about, James, where you are noticing these patterns, you've got a lower area of green. The red is concentrations of artifacts, green and yellow or lower amounts. This is an area we think is a garden. And when you turn off your, um, let me turn off the uh, metal detector survey here, this area corresponds roughly to where that potential garden is. So. We've got some work to do in that area to, to examine it. But um, what we've, um, you know, the work that we've done in the area of the home farm is really in many ways only possible because some of the preservation that's happened at Montpelier. Um, what, what happens to this area in 1844 when Dolly sells the, sells the property is most of these buildings, like the, the slave quarters, the enslaved um, homes for uh, the cabins for, for homes for, for folks, are basically falling apart. They're abandoned. And what ends up, we end up with is, you know, the features that get preserved that we excavate to find where these structures are. But what we get is, you know, all these, this area is abandoned. And where the new farm complex is built by the next owners starting in the 1850s, is on the other side of the property away from this area in what we call, you know, today the farm complex or what's called Poplar Run Valley because of the stream that runs through this area. And today, this is where the archaeology lab is located, um, where you'll be, you know, spending time washing artifacts. Um, and then also, for those of you all that stay in the village, this is where you've got the village housing um, and also where we're going to be doing lectures down at Lewis Hall. But all this area was developed in the, um, the 1850s. But when the DuPonts buy the property in 1901, that's where they build the majority of their farm complex. So they really radically alter this area. But what it means is the old farm complex over on this side is basically left alone. And what you get is the only thing that's, that's built here is a... Um, yeah, is the um, where the visitor center is today. There is a an Olympic sized swimming pool built in the 1920s and a tennis court. So when I, when I started at Montpelier in 2000, these pool cabanas were, were still here as well as the swimming pool. And what the Duponts had established in this area was a basically an entertainment area where they didn't want this area plowed, and they're also I mean, they were the DuPonts. They didn't need to make a couple hundred dollars off of the field. They had all their Delaware investments that they had. So what, what, what resulted is all this area gets preserved. And when you look at Montpelier as a whole, when you look at all the woodland that's here, you know, we've got 2,650 acres. And of that acreage, 1,800 acres is wooded. And when you look back, you know, when you start looking at some of the metal detector surveys that we've done, what you'll see is that when you start to move into some of these areas that are woodlots today, what we found are uh, everything from uh, homes for the enslaved, where there's there's chimney bases that are in, in the woods. This is the base of a chimney here. And many years ago, these are the excavations that we did that where we uncovered this uh, structure. 
But then also on the same area plot of woods, what you've got is um, these uh, um, areas of, uh, of tobacco barns that are not showing up in my GIS. Here we go. These, we've got areas that are tobacco barns that are today in the middle of the woods. And so what does it mean about this woodlot if you've got a tobacco barn in the middle of it today? The second growth forest. Exactly. It's all second growth forest. And what's amazing about these woodlots is these have been growing up in this area since the end of the civil since the end of the civil war so you've got just incredible preservation and in many areas what we found is we've found these in the middle of the woods what you find are these uh tree lines like this is a line of tulip poplars and these tulip poplars are over 200 years old that are right along a property line that dates to the late 18th century so what we've what we've got with Montpelier is you know something that goes way beyond the main house. It's way beyond the house with the columns that we've restored. It's this larger plantation that all feeds into um, uh, what be, what what built Montpelier and, and the enslaved community. Over there were, at any one time, there was over 120 individuals who were enslaved, enslaved Americans at Montpelier. That were both doing the um, running the plantation, doing the blacksmithing, uh, uh, doing the cooking for the entertaining that Dolly is so well known for. And the testimony for this is, you know, all the archaeology we've done. You know, there's, uh, when you start looking at all of the sites that we've excavated through the years, like especially, like, for the example, the area in the South Yard, pretty much every artifact that we've found. Uh, Dennis gave this beautiful example of this a, a year ago when we were talking about, you know, the importance of working with the descendant community. He said, you know, it all, you know, for example, here, this, all these squares are areas where Dennis has done metal detector survey and he's located tens of thousands of artifacts. He said the only artifact he's ever found that could be, that could be attributed to the Madisons was a thimble that was in the middle of the Pine Alley when he did survey in that area. Everything else is artifacts that would have been created, used, and you know disposed of by members of the enslaved community. So you know it really gives testimony to who's running this plantation was the enslaved community. They essentially were the um, uh, were the. Um, uh, they held the owner's manual for this for this property in their heads and it's you know it's it's where you know when the when the when the enslaved community is sold by dolly madison in 1844 not only is it, do the are the families broken up but so much of this information that would have been passed down through the generations is lost because those generations of families are are broken apart and so that's where you know it's no wonder that you know Montpelier goes into decline after Dolly sells the plantation. I mean, basically the owner's manual for the plantation is gone. It was in people's heads. And so the liquidation of the community because of the debts that Dolly, you know, uh, inherited from James Madison um, is what ends, ends this, this long history. But what we've, what, what we've done with the archaeology and working with the descendant community at Montpelier is really begun to bring this back to life. And one area that we've, you know, really is, uh, um, uh, we've got a lot of pride in is the area of the South Yard. And, you know, today it looks like, you know, I, I was talking with uh, Tess about this earlier today, is that um, I'm, I know that many of you all probably remember when the South Yard didn't look like this, that it looked more like this site where we had these timber frames that, Illust you know, showed visitors where the buildings are. We were doing archaeology. And we found that when people were in this space, they ask a whole lot more questions about what this space was, as opposed to when it's reconstructed. Because what they asked was, you know, is this where the enslaved community was? And then they would draw out conversations about this. And today, what we've got is uh, a much more sanitized version of this space. I mean, we've got these buildings that are architecturally, you know, 
are similar to the main house in that they have glazed windows, they've got masonry chimneys, very different from the log structures that are on the rest of the property that uh, families are living in. And all this is based on the archaeology that we did in the South Yard. And we'll talk more about this, but in a, in a kind of a thumbnail sketch of this, what we found when we did excavations in the South Yard is evidence for buildings with masonry foundations, uh, masonry, ch the chimneys were, were built of either brick or stone, and there's a, quite a bit of investment put into these. And when we did the archaeology of this space, what we found was that when you started looking at the um, the areas where you've got uh, buildings and where uh, you, you have concentrations of artifacts, there are these areas of swept yards. For example, here's the South Kitchen. This is what the South Kitchen looks like today with the, the, no the North Dwelling right here. But this is what it looked like with the archaeology. You can see the chimney base right here. This is this faint outline is the outline for the foundation, and it goes under here as well. The kitchen has this, this quite dramatic foundation here. But all the area in here, what we found was, is evidence for a swept clay yard. And uh, down in the bottom where the, the smoke houses were, this is where, when we did the excavations in these areas, this is where we found evidence for massive accumulations of of trash from both from sweeping and disposing of objects and where we got so many of the items that we've reconstructed and are in the South Yard buildings today. But what we've got with the archaeology we've done with this space is really a, a nuanced understanding that these buildings, what would have been present and more visible was the yard spaces. And this is why we're so excited about the program next week is instead of you know, doing the cooking program, you know, um, on the other side of the property, uh, away from the visitor core, we're going to be doing this right in the south yard. So we're going to be building, you know, a fire, uh, outdoor fire here for doing hearth cooking between the kitchen and the smokehouse. Because when we did the excavations um, at the kitchen, we found this cook platform that was right here with all this scorched clay. And then in addition to that, what we're going to be doing is in the area right between this smokehouse and the duplex, we're going to be digging a trench and roasting a uh, suckling pig. I've, I've got it already ordered. I'm going to pick it up on Tuesday. I'm somehow going to have to put it in the fridge at the visitor center and not freak people out when they open up the fridge and there's a whole pig in the kitchen and in, in the fridge. So we'll, we'll see what happens with that. But um, we're going to roast the pig here. Because when we did the excavations uh, several years ago, all right, a decade ago, <laughs> time flies, we found this barbecue trench and literally found a shoat's jaw, a, a young pig's jaw in this trench. And it was charred. And there's these accounts from one of Dolly's nieces who talk about, you know, these barbecues that would happen on the back lawn and there would be animals roasted whole that would be served to over 100 guests on the back lawn. Long time ago, we thought that would have occurred out, you know, the, the roasting pit would be somewhere in here. But when we did the excavations of the South Yard back in 2011, that's when we found this barbecue trench. So we want to recreate that on the landscape and really, in many ways, begin to make this into the living landscape that it was back in the day. And what you, for those of y'all that have been, in, been at a, been at the site when you're walking around the unit and after about two weeks what happens to all the grass around the unit just gets pounded flattened. down yeah flattened it gets pounded down there's no more grass there and it that's part of what you know when you see that you know you've got a space that's alive you know it sounds ironic if there's no get rid of the green it sounds like it's dead but it's actually alive with traffic and that's one thing we want to do in the South Yard is begin to make this space more alive. So what's what's um, what's uh, fun about having, you know, in this lecture, the folks that are coming on the week long program at the end of this month to do work at the Overseer's site. And at the Overseer's site, what we've got is a series of features. These are these are the when you zoom in, let me give you a chance to breathe here. When you give you a chance where the context is, 
here's here's the visitor center right here. Um, what we were talking about just a few minutes, just a second ago, was the main house, which is right here. Let me see if I can get that cursor on this. There's the main house. The south yard is all this area right here. Here's the visitor center. And down here is the home farm, which is all this area. And then right in here, right by the Madison Family Cemetery, is what we call the overseer's house because we have an 1844 map that shows the overseer's house being somewhere between the main house. So if you look at, the, look at this house, look at this image from 1844, this map, you've got the Madison dwelling, Montpelier dwelling right here, the Madison mill here, and then somewhere in between you get the overseer's house. Well, if you look at this map right, or the, the aerial right here, the mill is right at this spot right here. That's the silo ruin. Let me see, I don't have the mill on here, but the um, this building right here, the dairy barn ruin, part of it, the stone wall is the old mill from the Madison time period. And this, the, um, the, the Madison mill dates back to the 1720s. So you've got the mill right here, You've got the um the the main house right here. Somewhere in between here, you get the overseer's house. And this is where, with the metal detector surveys, we've located um, let me get it here, all this concentration of artifacts. And then what we've done is opened up units and found all kinds of uh, features in this area, everything from subfloor pits. And this, this, this is a subfloor pit that we found back in 2020. This is this stain right here with all the charred wood. The red clay is the surrounding undisturbed red clay. This is a what's called a subfloor pit. And it's typically what you find underneath slave quarters, these cabins that we, we've excavated through the years. So for example, out at the, uh, at the, at the, uh, the field quarter, where you've got these log structures we've reconstructed. Here's the visitor center up here. This pit right here, you can see a detailed shot of it right here, is this squared off pit. And this actually had a basket, a burned basket in the bottom of it. And this is where um, probably the enslaved household kept their root crop, more likely sweet potatoes. And sweet potatoes need to be kept through the wintertime warm and dry and the only place you're gonna have that is a hearth. So what these subfloor pits represent are areas where you've got a building, and this is how we knew where these buildings were. So for example, where this subfloor pit is, this is where we reconstructed the log building right here. And so we're at the overseer's house. What we've got is this one area that has a subfloor pit, which is indicative of a log structure but then have this massive concentration of brick over in, in this area right in here, which potentially could be the structure that's shown on this map from 1844 that has these chimneys on it. You know, whether that's a representational map or not, it's hard to say. What we found at the overseer's house is this concentration of brick, which usually is associated with the chimney stack. So, what we've got is this, you know, incredibly complex site that we're discovering through the archaeology. And then when we do the archaeology in this space, what we're able to do is begin to reconstruct that either through 3D renderings like, you know, that we've got, um, you know, uh, with this scene right here, showing the overseer's house, visitor centers up in this area. This is the area we're going to be excavating starting, you know, in, in two weeks. Do it through these reconstructions. Or, you know, you know the, these kind of reconstructions are ones that are still, or you can have it on a map right here, which is pretty cumbersome to deal with. But what we can also do is we've got, we've been, been beginning to do 3D renderings of the landscape. And so you can see right here starting to come into view is the main house. And in this rendering, let's put the roof on the, the main house here. Uh, yeah, so it's a little more complete. You've got the main house right here. 
you've got the south yard in this area. What we've what we're doing is starting to build a 3D version of Montpelier. And this is one, remember at the beginning of the conversation, we're talking about how there's no way to reconstruct this entire space. Well, with a 3D rendering, you can begin to create a virtual reality of all this space. And what we've got represented here are all these buildings. And what Tess has done is she has begun to represent Let's see. Yeah, the blacksmith shop. Where am I? Here we go. Um, oh, there's the pump house. Yeah, I gotta I gotta back up a little bit. With these 3D landscapes, it's so easy to get lost on this. Here's the uh here's the um this is the Madison family cemetery right here. Here's the and here's the overseer's house right here. So in this case, what she's represented is the overseer's house that you can see right there with the brick chimney and the stone chimney base. And then across the road, what you've got is the uh, um, the uh, the forge for the blacksmith shop. So we're slowly beginning to build these out on the landscape and get these represented. And then of course, what we can also do, which you which what you can't do with a, a, a real landscape is represent different periods in time. So we can represent, for example, you know, Mount Pleasant in this area, or if we, you know, if we get this model pretty sophisticated, what we could do is take the wings off the main house, take off the 1797 portion right here and get back to this 18th century structure that is, uh, you know, between the two chimneys right here. So, what we're, you know, what, one thing that we're, um, uh, you know, we're looking to do at Montpelier is, of course, take the archaeology and interpret the landscape. And again, this can be done on a virtual level, or it can also be done through reconstructions. But again, when you start looking at some of these reconstructions that we've done, for example, with the South Yard, what you get is, you know, the buildings there, but then not the landscape really represented as it was with the swept yards. And so this is where, you know, um, we're, we're constantly looking for new ways to really begin to, to bring the life back to these spaces. And this is something that we're gonna go into a lot more depth on when you all are here. Um, but does anybody have any questions so far? I've um, uh, been doing more of a, too much more of a monologue than a uh, open discussion here. Well, I have I to. I, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I have to ask. It our scheduled time, I think, is May seventh. So I'm I'm hoping I'm in the right meeting. <laughs> oh yeah, there. Let me um. Let me. <laughs> they sent me the link, and I'm not hearing our date, so I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, Jill, I will check on that for you. Um, yeah, I mean, this is great, though. I mean, I, I was curious to see if we were going to do the Overseer's Cottage on May yeah. 7th, too. <laughs> so you're, what program are you on, you all on, Jill? What's the I have no it? idea. It okay. says Expedition. I mean, do you want me to try to look up the email? I'll, I'll, I'll look it up after this, and I'll send you a note to okay. confirm it. Yeah, yeah. but all, I, I, all I mean, of the digs we're going to be doing this year are at the overseer's house. Oh, so excellent. we're going to be focusing okay. on that all year. So you, you've got, you, you all have, have have advanced background now in all this. And when, if you, I'll look you up and make sure you're in the right spot. So I'll send you an email right after that. All right. Yeah. We don't mind attending another one, but I just, I sort of wondered if we were at the right meeting. <laughs> no, good to ask questions like that. Absolutely. So <laughs> we'll get you straightened out. Thank you. Matthew, Gail, are, something? Oh, James, yeah. Uh, Gail can go first. Gail has a question. But she's not here right now. Okay. <laughs> she Maybe she Jump has a question, but she's not here anymore. Um, <laughs> are are all the enslaved persons' houses uh, clay-based? Their floors, they're, they're not what was the planked or anything. They're just clay, right? It, yeah. For the log structures, we've got the indication is is that they're clay uh clay structures so if you look at the um for example the stable quarter 
this structure right here, when we did the excavations back in 2010, this building is uh, reconstructed today and looks like this with the mm -hmm. two chimneys on either side that are stick and mud chimneys. And what we found with the archaeology, though, is we found a um, these this brick that's here is not the base for the chimney. That's the base of the firebox. So this is the hearth where the fires are being made. And what what was evidence for that was that the um, on this on this hearth the, the 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 brick was incredibly heat altered and eroded. And then over on this one, what we found was the, literally the last log that was burned before the the structure collapsed onto it. But mm -hmm. given that this hearth is at grade, what it means is this would have been a, a, a clay floor inside the building. And clay fo floors were the typical way that most people, that most structures that people were living in were, um, were, were built. And the kind of ironic thing about the clay floor is at the time, it was called a dirt floor, which is kind of a derogatory way of describing it because it was anything but dirt. You know, a clay floor is, is, is not just swept clean, but it's a masonry floor that if it's kept dry, is hard as a rock. It's, it's basically a masonry floor. And what that would mean is in the wintertime, you wouldn't have drafts coming up through the floorboards. And then also with it being clean, you, you'd be able to clean it and wax it. So I, when I was, did my field work in Jamaica, I uh, visited several older people's homes that had clay floors and they would literally apply a red wax to it and it would shine beautifully. And I've lived in houses like where I did my field school in St. Mary's uh, County, where there was a wooden floor in the house and uh, about an hour of living there, my legs were covered with fleas because there were fleas that had laid eggs between the floorboards. So, you know, <laughs> it, depending on what, what you got, it would be a very different uh you know the cleanliness is um, there. There's this the the status that's there as well. So yeah, but most structures would have had a swept clay floor. Now in the south yard, what we've got is evidence for um, uh, in this case raised wooden floors because what we have is the chimney base. So the actual chimney that we've got the base for, but there's no hearth. There's no hearth base, and that hearth base is not here because it would have been raised up off the ground at, as part of the wooden floor. And when the structure was torn down, that hearth would have been removed as well. And so that's why there's no evidence of a clay floor in this area. Okay, right, thank you. Gail, did I, I, you have a question? Well, I think one of the things that has always intrigued me was the fact that people say, well, why is there so much archaeology. Why do you promote so much archaeology at Mount Pelier? And when we, after being there a few times, we uh, learned that most of Madison's papers were burned. So if we didn't have archaeology, you wouldn't know any of this. Yeah. Oh, thank you for that, Gail. I, I totally forgot to talk about that. Is that, you know, we have very few surviving documents. The ones that describe where structures are, or that one that um, uh, I showed that's that uh, the plat right here the, the from 1844. And then the other one is the, um, for the South Yard is this insurance plat from 1837 that shows where the buildings are. And this is where, you know, it made looking for these buildings a bit like shooting fish in a barrel. You know, it, it, it could pretty much provide the blueprint for, for dig here. But other than that, you know, for all the rest of the property, you know, where we were doing our metal detector surveys and the LIDAR, we were having to find these, you know, through survey. And the other thing that, that, that with the burning of the documents all of the uh, the farm books that certainly would have been present at Montpelier that describe what kind of crops were growing, where were all lost. And one thing that we've been able to do is recover some of this information um, with crops, with the LIDAR surveys, because with the LIDAR surveys, for example, in these wooded areas, what you can see, here's woods right here, is you can see these linear patterns where you've got uh, uh, old field lines. 
And then finding the structures where the barns are, if you've got a threshing barn, you know, it's processing wheat. So, you know, there would have been wheat fields in this area. But in addition, what these, what the archaeology provides is really, um, is, a, is a witness to the actions of the enslaved, which, you know, when, 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 when Madison's paper, papers are described as being burned in 1852, they ended up at his stepson's house. And when his stepson, John Payne Todd, died, all Madison's nieces and nephews go to the stepson's house, find literally two rooms full of documents, and they say that they confine all of the secrets of their uncle Jimmy that no, that he wouldn't want to have, have be seen to the flames of, of time. And so all of it's reduced to ashes. And so what that would have destroyed not only is, you know, what, you know, the, the, uh, the layout of, of the plantation, but also in many ways, much of the record of the accomplishments of the enslaved in terms of, you know, what work they were doing. But with the archaeology, what we're able to do is recover that. And for that reason, uh, the, the MDC calls the, the, you know, the archaeology of this landscape is, you know, calls the landscape a, literally a memory device. Because for the, for the descendants of the enslaved at Montpelier, all, all, almost all their memories were in many ways consumed in that fire, uh, burning the documents, but also... When, they're, when their ancestors are sold and families are divided, the, the, the traditional way of carrying on oral history for many families was lost. Because if you're separated from your grandparents, you're not going to have those memories passed along. And so the, this landscape holds that memory. And that's where, you know, the space of the, uh, the burial ground is one area that we're really excited about looking at is this space is one of the best preserved burial grounds in uh, uh, of any plantation site that we know of. It's never been plowed. It's got evidence for the for the burials in this area, and we're going to be able to uncover information. You know, not only about commemoration of this space, but if the descendants so choose, is also begin to examine the actual burials themselves. And there's all sorts of dietary information, facial reconstruction that can happen. But that's something that's a very personal history that descendants are going to make the decision on. Um, and uh, so, um, so yeah, those documents were were are pretty inf have informed how we've approached the archaeology, the loss of those documents, and it's made archaeology a pretty central part of understanding all of this. So, I think one of the other things that always intrigued me. Uh, having been raised in Springfield, Illinois, in the Midwest, and not exposed to anything segregation all my growing up years, uh, that when Dolly had to sell the slaves, that was the end of the farm. You could have 2,000 plus acres, but you have no one to work it. You have nothing. And I'd never, I'd never really thought about that in, in that concept. Yeah. And when Dolly sells the community, what she sells is basically the owner's manual for that yeah. 5,000 acre farm. You know, the knowledge of where the best clays are for making brick, where the best stands of uh, walnut are, where to grow crops, all that is gone. And so, yeah, it's uh, um, the, the community is what made Montpelier, what it was, that intellectual knowledge base was rested in the in the hands of the community. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to um, turn, I'm going to stop sharing screens and um, yeah, see a couple of folks have had to sign off. Um, what I wanted to do is give give folks a chance to ask any other other questions you might have and I, I don't want to also I don't want to keep you all all night, you know, but we'll, we'll have plenty of chance to talk when you all get here. Better. But are there any other burning questions that folks have? I, I have a question. How involved are the descendants in the telling of the story of Montpelier? Uh, I met some folks down in um, up in D.C. a couple weeks ago. Um, at a social innovation lab of descendant communities. And I'm just 
interested to know like how they would tell the story of Montpelier that would be different than the way you're telling it um I guess that's my question like and do they do these types of presentations because I don't I'm not I don't know I am a descendant and um I guess when you were talking about the power place I really just wanted to wait and see um what was happening before I made any kind of comment and I I I just think that I think that the the people who cared for, maintained, nurtured, and kept um, the Montpelier community were way more than the quote unquote owners' manual. I mean, they were the lifeblood of it. Um, and I'd just be interested to know, um, yeah, what role the descendants have in the telling of this story. A absolutely, that's that's one. Um area that uh, with peer stewardship of the descendant community, what we're, um, with the overseer, with the with the work that we're doing at the home farm and the overseers project, we're gonna be working with the, with the MDC on the questions, yeah. and the interpretations we're gonna be making of those spaces. And that's incredibly important. And, and getting language right is one thing that we wanna really focus on. And, and so, like using a term like the owner's manual, if you know that's something we want to examine and correct. If it's something that makes you know simplifies things or something or essentializes things too much, there one of one of our, our, our one of the staff uh, at Montpelier, part of the archaeology staff, uh, Becca Davis, is writing her dissertation. She's an archaeologist. She's writing her dissertation on on the archaeology of Montpelier and doing interviews with descendants to begin to understand <laughs> just what you're saying, which is to get, give, um, have this information be co-curated with the descendant community so descendants can tell the story of their ancestors using the, the framing of questions, the language, that gives uh, uh, more power to that to that story uh, in terms of the perspective that's provided um, by descendants, and that's something with the with memorialization where we're you know the um, the 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 MDC has uh, received that grant for five point seven million dollars for building the memorial at the burial ground. That is essentially going to be a, that is going to be a descendant led project where how that memorial is built, which really is, you know, one of the, is the most sacred space at Montpelier, the burial ground for the enslaved, is going to be told from the perspective and from un, with under the direction of the descendant community. So that's that's a that's our next real important phase at Montpelier that we've never been able to achieve with the, with the kind of management that we've had in the past. And today, that's a different story with co-stewardship with the descendant community. And we're, we're really excited about this because some of the major discoveries we've made have not been so much from, you know, how we dig in the ground, but the kind of questions we ask. And one question when we were, you know, 10 years ago when we started looking at the South Yard, descendants asked us about, you know, you know, we know that our ancestors worked hard. We know that their labor was taken from them. But when you're talking about Madison in the main house, you talk about Madison from an, his intellectual contributions. What were the intellectual contributions of our ancestors in these same spaces? And that's been a major focus that we've had that comes from, you know, working with the community. So, yeah, I'm with you. I'm, I mean, I'm, I just I just think about Alexis de Tocqueville and how he came over here and wrote, you know, basically that the... Um, you know, plantation owners actually didn't really do anything and that, you know, it wasn't going to, slavery wasn't going to survive in the United States because they were just extracting a lot of labor and not really um, being uh, fair <laughs> to the people they were extracting from me. I mean, and he came right before, I think, the French Revolution. Mm. But my, my, my point is that I just, I hear what you're saying and I think from my perspective, I'm I'm gonna come up with um with Jerome next week to cook. And I think from my perspective, these kind of talks of like introducing the space 
one of the things you guys could do in the future is involve some descendant community folks to kind of help tell the story. Like just having them on the phone and having them in the conversation, I think is really super important because you know it gives it gives a levity to a levity to it and a respect um to the work um that you know i mean i'm not a descendant of that community i'm a descendant of another um community but it just it gives our ancestors their you know their rightful respect and not saying that it's it's not respectful i just think that it's really super important um, with everything that's going on around critical race theory and what everybody's talking about as far as education, like it's really super important to get the perspective um, of the people who've survived and thrived since that situation. You know what I mean? And having them as part of the conversation from the beginning, I think is really super important because it establishes that, you know, their legacy hasn't been forgotten and that, um, you know, they're still there. Um, because we're still here in North Carolina, like we haven't gone anywhere yeah. either. We're still here and we're still, you know, we are we are their legacy. And I think it's really super important to just give that credence and give it that levity and give it that power of place, meaning present in the talking. I think is really super important. I don't even know if they want to do it, but I think it would be really important to have them part of it is all I'm trying to say. I think, Kanita, I love this suggestion because that would show a, like a very successful engagement between what we're doing with archaeology and descendants. And I love what you're saying, you know, in terms of, you know, having that voice, the voice of descendants in an intro lecture like this, that's the testimony of the power of the families and the individuals that we're finding their record, their material record, because it, it, that's the survival of, of, uh, of people. And, and the, 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 the mere fact that someone is a, you know, identifies themselves as a descendant Mm -hmm. gives testimony to their part of their identity comes from a knowledge that their ancestors have passed along and they're you know striving to learn more about their ancestors and that not yeah and not just it. that it's also like the love i mean i think black people are still here in the united states and that we're still um living and thriving and surviving because of the love that our ancestors have for us and for um us to continue and so i think it, it's just it's really important because, you know, it's kind of jarring to hear you talk about we're going to talk to the descendant community see if we can dig up these graves. It just kind of sounds like some grave robbers, you know what I'm saying? Like, and I think oh, if yeah. you had, I think oh, if you had a descendant who said, we're thinking about seeing what our ancestors lived like and we're debating whether or not we want to disturb their grave. I mean, it's, it's just, it, it, it resonates completely different than coming from, and I don't mean no offense, my man. I mean, I think you gave me a lot of really great information tonight, but you know, it's just like some Indiana Jones grave robbing stuff, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like, and and to have- Oh, there's a legacy of that, Kanita, where- Absolutely, and that, yeah. And that's, there's a terrible legacy where archeologists have excavated burial grounds of in, in, in enslaved communities and the bodies have ended up in storage. And the yeah, I mean, even in indigenous voice. communities, Native American communities, and I was just reading um, recently about the Met and their ill-gotten gains and how they've, you know, stolen a lot of um, statues and deities from um, rural Asia, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. And that it's like in their coffers, like, and so I think, you know, I'm not trying to be any kind of way. I just think it's really, really important that when you start to talk about those kinds of things, that you have the people from those communities talking about that, because that means that they're interested, that they want to do it. And that comes mm -hmm. off a lot, lot different than, you know, an archaeologist saying they want to do that. And that's that's all I'm saying. Yeah, I'm with that. I think that would I, I appreciate you giving this perspective, Kanita, because this is this is the this is the goal that we have is to um, have the descendants have ownership over their ancestors, you know, the archeological record, because it is, yeah. you know, the legacy that we as archeologists are 
it's excavating, but it belongs in in so many ways to descendants, and it's it's a, right. it's a sacred connection that um, we're stewards, and we need to make sure we're protecting what we're excavating. And uh, when it comes to burials, I you know when I was talking about excavating the burials, that is that is not I have like I'm with you. I have no voice to say that. And this is something that is going to be, you know, decided by the descendant community. And it's something that, you know, you're right. I, I should ask how to talk about that, because that's that's a very um, sensitive and, and intimate topic that, um, you know, we want to be respectful of. Yeah, so, I just think you have to. I mean, you know, it's all about, like you said, the power of place in the beginning and who's, you know, like. What we're debating about on a national level right now is whose place is it to tell our national history, like essentially, mm -hmm. right? And so, you know, this is part of that discussion. So I just think, you know, give the people who it impacts the most and who it's directly connected to, give them that place. Yeah, that's, and what one thing um, you're, that many of you all have been on programs know this and that uh, when you come on a program, you're part of the the Montpelier family. And um, what we want to do is have conversations just like this, that are hard conversations that um, challenge us to think more about what we do. And, you know, it's kind of like when you go to an, a, a friend, a casual friend's house, and the potatoes are burned and you get a stomach ache afterwards, you might just tell them the dinner's delicious and not go back. But if it's your your brother and you go to his house and you're gonna be like, no, the potatoes are awful and I I I couldn't sleep all night. So, you know, we wanna wanna have have these kind of honest conversations. And that's what okay. makes my paleo a place that's very different from a lot of others. And we take pride in that. Yeah, well, Matt. Uh, I'm oh, sorry. But I was going to say, Matthew, there is a parallel to that, too. Um, Williamsburg, with their excavation of the churchyard that they were doing on there and they're currently involved in, uh, very, worked very closely with the descendant population. And uh, much of the work they're doing is is non-invasive into the graves themselves. They're, they're mapping location without excavation. So mm -hmm. things like like LIDAR and things like that. So uh, it's interesting because the, the descendant community has been very active in trying to establish you know what what the interactions were and how things were done so it's it's a great conversation because the the activity is directly tied to the consensus of how things are and you know to find out those things so it's a dialogue that should always be done which is we're looking at this group of enslaved peoples this is their properties this is their graves um what can we know from that what the descendant community wanted to know because interesting enough the the Wimsburg excavation of the church produced a lot of information that wasn't previously known to the community. Uh, and, you know, there was a, a great deal of respect from all sides and how the whole decision-making process was going. I'm envisioning that's kind of how the organization would do it here was, you know, what does, what is the consensus? What do we need to know? What are the research objectives? You know, the things we want to find out, um, you know, because I think the idea would be, you know, is the idea of, of, of what kind of respect was paid to the folks. If this is the graveyard, was it when given the respect it was needed? What mm -hmm. historically was the treatment at that particular time for for graves and enslaved people being buried on you know properties that under the ownership they supposed of the person who was the overseer and the property owner, so it raises a lot of interesting questions. Yeah, there's when we're doing the work in the burial ground, uh, for example, we one of our plans is to do a metal detector survey in the burial ground. Um, and it would be near surface looking for and and being very, very careful to, to not disturb any human remains. And the goal is to find fencing from the 19th and 20th century in that area. But before doing that, we're like the next week, I'm giving this presentation to the memorialization committee that's all made up of exclusively MDC members. And they're going to hear what our plans are and give approval or disapproval for that or ask questions. So every step of the way um, with the archeology span and the burial ground, we're doing this. And this is something we want to mirror with any archeology span we're doing. We What we see is 
what we see ourselves as, as archaeologists at a place like Montpelier is as technicians that provide a technical service, but the questions, you know, really the, the, um, that where those questions are generated, the more we can have the community involved in that process and understanding what archaeology is, what kind of evidence we're doing, using this is where our these kind of ex expedition programs are so critical to have more and more MDC members, uh, Montpelier descendant community members take part in. And it's going to give more ownership over the information and uh, how we approach it. So it's it's exciting. And, and also, we're going to have insights we've never had. I mean, this is where, you know, studies that have involved the communities have come up with research and analysis techniques that have changed the discipline. Like the African Burial Ground Project is a case in point that was run by Dr. Michael Blakey, who is a descendant of Montpelier, which is mind blowing. I've, I've been a student of Dr. Blakey's for 30 years. And when I started here, I asked if he would come down and talk at our first descendant gathering in 2001. And I was explaining him to uh, explaining to him how to get to Montpelier. And he's like, Matt, I know where Montpelier is. I know where Orange County is. And I was like, what? And he's like, my family's from there. And so, but he's been our guiding force in all this, but he get, tells stories of doing work in the African burial ground. This is a site in downtown Manhattan where the GSA, the government service agency was building a building and the previous archeologist hadn't done due diligence in understanding what was there. And they came across what was called the, the, the uh, it was a burial ground for, um, Africans who had been kidnapped and brought to the new world. And it was 18th century and just these incredible set of well-preserved um, skeletal remains. And the first set of archeology span that happened there did not involve the community. And there was a major set of demonstrations that happened. And Dr. Blakey and his team was brought in and they led the first descendant-based research project. And that project, ended up being where that burial ground wasn't wasn't honored by just a plaque on the wall it's a national monument today run by the park service and the questions that the community asked about diet about you know were the folks that were that were being encountered you know the human remains were they african born or were they born in north america those were questions that archaeologists had never asked and didn't even think were possible to answer. But Dr. Blakey's team took those questions and found ways to analyze it. And one of the things they, they looked at with, was um, isotopic analysis of teeth enamel. So when you're in utero, your teeth are forming and the minerals that your mother's drinking and when you're an infant, you're drinking form the mineral base for your teeth. You can test those and see where your, you know, where where that mineral base is 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 a signature of the area you're from, and so these kind of questions didn't come from the scientific community; they came from the descendant community, and so that's where you know we're excited about this from the chance just to ask new questions that have never been asked, and like I said, some of the best questions we've asked. And some of the assumptions that have been reversed by, you know, by, by conversations with the descendant community have led us to some of our greatest discoveries. So, and it's, it's like, it's what you're uh, talking about, Kanita, is like the folks that have the most uh, uh, to gain or lose are descendants in some of these, in the, in these questions we're asking, because as descendants, it's, you know, your identity is from your ancestors and we're studying your ancestors as archaeologists so that gives us us an ethical position to include descendants in the creation of the questions what sites are excavated and an opportunity that is unparalleled so some exciting things that it, our wildest dreams have been realized here at montpelier with montpelier being in co-stewardship with the descendant community I, you know, I, I, when I started here 20 years ago, this wasn't even, a, couldn't even dream of this happening. So it is incredible to have this uh, be what, 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 where we're at right now. So one of the things, Matt, that I, you know, we've been to quite a few expeditions 
And I'd like to see, hopefully at some point in time, the word get out to the descendant community or friends of the descendant community to join us in those expeditions. And that's that's beginning to happen. I was talking with literally our our, our department today had a, a had a, a forum discussion with Dr. Blakey and another uh, descent, very prominent descendant in the, in the anthropology community, Dr. Iris Ford. And we're talking about ways in working with the um, project director of the MDC to find ways to do what you're saying, Gail, which is to have more um, uh, descendants involved in these programs and you know find ways to, to bridge that. Uh, um, because that helps us learn too. Yeah, absolutely. So it's... Uh, we're um it's a this is you know what i love about montpelier is we have gone through so many changes over the past you know 23 years i've been here alone and this is like a whole new job at this point you know in terms of what we're doing how we're doing our work and you know it's uh um uh it's it's a, it's an exciting time matt i have a question um, yeah. For the culinary expedition, the public is going to be free to move through the Montpelier, uh, and it might be a way to do a quick invitation to invite some people in the local community to come see what's going on, because it, it'll be something live, like, that. because people always, they just stop and ask all sorts of questions when we're digging, and um, this is even more inviting than watching people get dirty. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm inviting there is them. nothing better than watching somebody get in the dirt. <laughs> yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to have to say that that's how I got called because I was vacationing up there and I saw people getting dirty. So, but I love food too. Don't get me wrong. I, I just left my clothes there when I left. So, <laughs> Well, you all give the best testimonials to um, folks coming out to visit the site when they see somebody and they say, you know, what are you doing here? And I'm from, from Idaho. How did you get to do this? That's absolutely right, Mark. <laughs> I had some housekeeping questions, but they're probably from Melissa. I'll, I'll give her a call tomorrow. Okay. Yeah, that sounds good. I'm going to do the same too, because um, we don't even know what program I'm on, but. um, <laughs> <laughs> That's important to know, Jill. That's, uh... I'm assuming I wear gloves, sunscreen, a hat and boots and stuff like that, you know, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. That You should well, ask Melissa to make sure that you've got the, because we have a whole packet of information we send. I'm and sure anybody you sent me more than enough. If anybody doesn't have that packet, let me know, and I'll I'll uh, I'll put my email in the chat. And... One, thing, one thing we've found, um, we're we're an older couple, as if you couldn't tell, and we have found we, we went to Lowe's and got five gallon buckets with a lid, and so we put our our of course we bought our our own Japanese trousers, and we've got our gloves, and uh, you know other stuff our kneeling pads kneeling pads are important and we just put that all in our five gallon bucket with the lid on it and it not only helps you get one bucket down to the site but it also makes a nice place to sit down when you want to rest a bit <laughs> oh my god i bet that's not in the handout that <laughs> sounds <laughs> fantastic <laughs> okay you should, okay matt, you, you, matt or matt five dollars can create matt, a lot matt, of comfort matt. for you matt Matt, okay, Matt, you got to take a lesson learned from that. I will tell Melissa well, to put that yeah. in. I love that the idea. The manians always show up with their How bucket. handy is that? Yeah, well, not everybody's as old as we are. He just turned 85, and, and I'll be 82. And so, you know, we need our five-gallon bucket because we got to have some place <laughs> to sit down. So, <laughs> and, and the whole logistics about, like, I do like food a lot. So are we just, we pack a lunch. Is it like that kind of a thing? Yes. Yeah, we yeah. you'll yeah. pack lunch because there's unfortunately there's no food service at uh, Montpelier. Um, I did for the cooking program that'll be very different. Jerome is having lunch uh, for each day, so uh, oh, good. for the culinary program, why work. can't we have the culinary program and the expedition one at the same time? <laughs> well, that's, that's, that, that's a good idea. Yeah, that'd be amazing. That's I, wonderful. When, when I, I did my food work in Jamaica. Um, I used to make uh, uh, peanut butter and jelly sandwiches for 
the yeah. um the the uh, uh those local community members that were helping me with the dig and one day my friend Linton was like Matthew we're not eating your so so food anymore right? you're we're you're gonna get chicken for us I'm gonna yeah. make you we're gonna have a bush meal so we'd always oh. have bush chicken which was amazing I'd never yeah. I'd love to have uh a cooked meal at the uh, site. <laughs> well, if, if the Mannings are staying in the village, I can put some food that we cook in the freezer for them. So okay, we'll be we'll be there up there. Just Love let me it, know. <laughs> I didn't know. I guess I missed the village meeting. We have a an Airbnb or that's supposed to be very close by. No, yeah, that's, that's not good. <laughs> that, that's good. Let, Jill, let's talk. Oh, the sorry. problem with the problem with the village is it's not always available and. We can get into the details with that. But uh, Jill, I'm going to make sure that uh, Melissa contacts you all and uh, okay. get you get you a set. You can put my name on there, too. So we'll we'll catch each other. Yeah, awesome. I mean, I'm the new bird to this, you know, and I talked Mr. Dooley into it. So we'll have to like. <laughs> well, I, I, she, I have under I've only now. I've only <laughs> been once, but staying uh, staying. Uh, in the village was a wonderful experience and the nature that's all around and just walking and listening to to the the place we're, we're going back to the importance of the place well I, I know I know it's not always there but sometimes it can sync up and and I look forward to staying there again well I do well, cook so if somebody invites me to the village I can bring something but, just to talk. Yeah. The thing is, Matt, if, you know, we'd be happy to talk to anybody. You want to share our email? We'd, we'd be happy to talk to anybody that, you know, just the, of what our experiences have been, not to okay. take them down the wrong path by any means, of course. But, uh, well, we'd be happy to, uh, I'm, gonna send I'm happy to do that, too. Okay, I think we should yeah, go, go, go back to hunter-gatherers. We should just scrounge the site for food and, you know get back to our roots in terms of eating things that we catch during the day. There's always a few ground, big fat groundhogs around. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. And they're, they're, those traditionally, uh, they're not that fine things. trees. Yeah. You know, it may I am great bringing my lunch. Was. Okay. I'm not depending on squirrels. <laughs> <laughs> squirrels nuts. run right up to you. Just a little bit of salt and pepper, you know, it's all cool. It's good. So get back to that, that, that to the, to the life existence there. So, you know, okay. or, Matt, Matt, can I sign off? Are we, have we done the educational part? Yeah, we have. Yeah. We're, we're all set. So what I'll do is, um, yeah, I'll email the recording out. And if anybody has any questions, you can email me and also email Melissa and we'll get things straightened out. So, but good seeing you all tonight. Okay. And oh, Matt, I have one, one quick question. Yeah. Did you did I understand that uh, during the dig program we're going to work on the um, digitization also? Yeah, we're de during the dig program gonna uh, we'll have a you know the normal one of the Wednesday morning training sessions on that, okay. and also right. be able to spend some time with you, Debbie, on that. I'm looking forward to that. Hi, Great. Debbie. Thank you. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> All so right, Matt, well, everybody. We, well, Matt, yeah, thank you. Um, I, we're gonna are we getting are we supposed to get a packet in the mail? It's a PDF packet of information through email. Okay, I'll check back. I don't think I have it. So, all right, I will. Um, I'm gonna uh look and see, James. What what um week are you coming on? I'm coming in for the dig. So oh, end of April. Yes. Okay. All right. I'm gonna um. I'm going to check with Melissa to make sure that got sent out. So I need to. Okay. Uh, okay. And I'll gather some squirrel recipes for Jill. That way. Sounds she, good. I, I want to institute know. a checklist for a lot of this because some things slip. So, but. Okay. All right. Well, thanks everybody. Thank you. Thank Look you, forward man. to seeing you Everybody. All. Mm -hmm. Bye. 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 Bye.